So the next speaker is Dr. Matthew Hanna. He is our, one of our youngest attendings. Uh, Matthew did his uh, residency in Mount Sinai. And he did his informatics fellowship at Pittsburgh and uh, did a search path fellowship at MSK only a year ago. And then he was instructor one year. He just started as assistant attending. He's um, very tech savvy. Uh, he's uh, really very involved in our digital pathology um, initiative, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you would see the way he presents that's in there. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So let's get started with case six. Ultimately, we're gonna go through this patient's journey in the uh, timeline that uh, she had come and presented. And like many patients, uh, she, had a, a, she came to MSK with a consultation of a breast biopsy, which then triggered all sorts of other imaging and other follow-up, which we'll go through and discuss. So who's our patient? She's a 59-year-old Taiwanese woman. She only has a past medical history of high blood pressure. 16 years ago, she had a fibroadenoma in the right breast, and otherwise really had no other prior surgeries, family history of malignancy, and is a never smoker. So she comes to uh, the emergency department at an outside hospital, has a palpable tender right lateral breast mass, so the same uh, breast that she had the fibroadenoma in, as well as a five pound weight loss. When she lies flat, she has some productive sputum, occasional cough, and then the emergency, uh, the emergency department physician palpated a right breast, three and a half centimeter mass in the right lateral, uh, right lateral aspect of her right breast, noted it was well circumscribed, mobile, had no, really no other axillary adenopathy, and uh, ultimately ordered a chest CT. So in the chest CT, uh, they found in the right lateral breast as they palpated a three and a half centimeter lesion. However, also uh, on the lung window showed about a 1.6 centimeter solitary lung nodule. This triggered a PET scan three days later, similar to the clinical exam, had no axillary mediastinal or hyalur adenopathy. And then the PET scan confirmed the hypermetabolic activity in the right breast mass with some central hypodensity that show, was suspicious for, for central necrosis. And then the lung mass also was confirmed uh, being hypermetabolic. For the patient's uh, right mammogram and ultrasound also confirmed the findings with an irregular mass being present and then uh, triggered the uh, nine o'clock right breast biopsy. So this is low power view of the biopsy and uh, just on low par power, there's a lot going on a very hypercellular. Uh, on higher power, we see evidence of malignant, uh, malignant spindle cells that are essentially traversing through these benign areas of the uh, breast parenchyma. Uh, another core biopsy essentially shows on high power, we have uh, spindle cells, stellate cells, hyperchromatic, I have a background of this mixochondroid stroma. And like most people, we all would always do stains. So the stains are located in the top right corner. This is CK56. Uh, no need to go further higher. So this is positive for uh, CK56. 34 beta E12. Pancytokeratin also showed good positivity, as well as uh, P63 uh, with diffuse and uh, strong nuclear staining. So with any malignant spindle cell lesion in the breast, first thought should be uh, metaplastic carcinoma, and so indeed this was, all, this was what it was called. Uh, this was also triple negative, and some triple negative uh, breast cancers are, may uh, have SOX10 positivity. However, this was negative for SOX10 as well as GATA3, and was ultimately diagnosed as a metaplastic spindle cell carcinoma of the breast. Another uh, 12 o'clock lesion uh, was also biopsied and is another fibroadenoma. So regarding the chest, the right upper lobe chest mass, uh, lung mass, uh, there was a CT guided biopsy a week after. And the lung biopsy shows slightly different morphology. So yes, we are in the lung. And um, in terms of what was present in the lung, there's a dual cell population. We see some tubular structures. Uh, 
luminal epithelial cells, some more basal myoepithelial cells with some areas of necrosis. And uh, another biopsy of the lung shows similar morphology and much more necrosis uh, in the second set of biopsy. So ultimately, stains were performed for a TTF1, which showed negative in both the uh, epithelial and myoepithelial population. Uh, good internal control there. GATA3, uh, with the history of the, of the breast carcinoma, GATA3 was also performed and shows some moderate staining. CK7 was positive, as well as CK5-6. We see good staining of the uh, epithelial cells and S100 in the myoepithelial component of this lesion. P40 also had good nuclear staining of the myoepithelial cells, as well as SOX10. DOG1 was done uh, in uh, differential diagnosis work of an acinic cell carcinoma. And at the end of the day, with this battery of stains being positive in, this, in the lung lesion and negative for TTF1, this was diagnosed as a malignant neoplasm with myoepithelial differentiation favoring a salivary gland type. So this also triggered a head and neck workup because of these two very distinct tumors trying to find a primary, which ultimately became negative. So this became much more of a clinical management discussion where if we have two very distinct tumors, what is the clinical uh, survey? So the discussion was to either remove the lung, maybe do neoadjuvant chemotherapy for the breast, and then have a, the, the resection of the breast. However, we know that metaplastic carcinomas don't necessarily respond well to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so the decision was to remove both breast and lung concurrently. So the patient was scheduled for breast conservation therapy and radiation, as well as a concurrent right upper lobe uh, lung wedge resection in two weeks. In that interim two weeks, her right breast uh, her right breast mass actually almost doubled in size, and they opted to change the plan, schedule the patient for a mastectomy and staging, followed by the lung surgery to be determined at, and, at, uh, at any reasonable rate once they figure out the pathology. So we received the mastectomy, and just in that short period of time, again, the initial palpated mass was three centimeters. This is now a 6.7 centimeter mass. We see some mottled areas, which are suggestive of some, of some hemorrhage, and some uh, tan yellow areas suggestive of necrosis. And so this looks very similar to the biopsy of the breast, very infiltrative into the fat. We see those same malignant spindle, cell, uh, malignant spindle cells with a mixochondroid background. And uh, this is just to show the deep margin here. So this black ink here, so it was about two centimeters from that, from that margin. So at least there were clear margins. However, of 22 sections from this tumor, uh, from this breast mass, which we also went back to the specimen to try to uh, identify other sections that we could find, this is the only one that showed similar morph uh, a similar morphologic entity than what we found in the lung with extensive necrosis, uh, mitotic activity, and again, we can see very well the dual cell population with the, uh, ep the luminal epithelial cells and uh, myoepithelial component. So looking at stains, essentially they stained very similar to um, each respective biopsies component. So 34 beta E12 being positive in, 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 those, in both components, P40 showing the myoepithelial cells in the dual cell population lesion, as well as staining nuclear positivity in the malignant spindle cells. GATA3 uh, with moderate uh, positive staining in the uh, dual cell population or epithelial cells, but negative in the malignant spindle cell lesion. Uh, calponin uh, being shown in the myoepithelial cells and very interestingly in the surrounding uh, malignant spindle cell area as well. Uh, both components were uh, negative for ER, PR, and uh, HER2 as well as AR. Uh, SOX10 was positive as it was in the biopsy in the uh, myoepithelial cells, but negative in the uh, malignant spindle cell area. TTF1 was negative in both components. So we have two very differing morphologies, but we can start to try to make sense of this because we have uh, the vast majority of the malignant spindle cell proliferation that is uh, in, in the breast with this, again, this back background of mixochondroid stroma versus this dual cell population with necrosis, high mitotic activity, as well as uh, this highland dense matrix deposition as well. And 
you can see why this generated such an issue in terms of clinical uh, or in terms of diagnostic for clinical management because they ultimately have the inverse uh, positive and negative uh, staining for the different antibodies or immunohistochemistry that were performed. So ultimately, this was diagnosed as a metaplastic spindle cell myoepithelial carcinoma arising in association with a malignant adenomyopithelioma. Being that the adenomyopithelioma was morphologically and immunohistochemically similar to the lung biopsy, it was consistent with metastatic adenomyopithelioma. And just to discuss about metaplastic and, uh, and adenomyopitheliomas, these were, uh, metaplastic carcinomas were first described in 1973 by Huvos, and he defined these as mammary carcinomas with mixed epithelial and sarcomatoid components. Uh, this is a, an umbrella term for a heterogeneous group of tumors. Uh, the uh, malignant component can be purely epithelial or mixed epithelial and mesenchymal. These are relatively rare tumor, or re relatively rare carcinomas on the breast cancer spectrum. Compared to the uh, traditional invasive ductal carcinomas, they have worse outcomes, more likely to be a larger tumor size, more likely to be triple negative, and have more of a hematogenous route of, of metastasis. The uh, 2012 WHO classification actually uh, classifies uh, myopithelial and epithelial myopithelial lesions uh, with both benign and malignant counterparts. So benign adenomyopithelioma is being benign, or if any of those epithelial or and or myopithelial components uh, undergo, undergo malignant transformation, uh, they would be classified as a malignant epithelial myopithelial lesion. And notably, myoepithelial carcinoma uh, is classified under metaplastic carcinoma. So there is a fifth edition of the WHO that I'll put a shameless plug out for, and I'm not an editor of the WHO by any means, but it will be out at the end of the year. And there is also a, uh, an, uh, the, there is a beta version online for the uh, fifth edition, which is available, as well as um, several of the other uh, newer editions uh, for the WHO classification, so this is available for anybody who's interested. Um, there will be some changes in the, in the new version of the WHO, specifically epithelial myopithelial lesions are dropping the adenoid cystic cat carcinoma category, which is now going into a new category called rare and salivary gland types, um, and there is no distinct myopithelial lesion uh, in, in the new WHO, and then the epithelial myopithelial lesions uh, are now categorized as pleomorphic adenomas, adenomyopitheliomas, and malignant adenomy adenomyopitheliomas. So adenomyopitheliomas were first described in 1970 by Hamperl. These are biphasic dual cell populations. They're usually benign. However, there have been rare reports of malignant change. There are, there are different subtypes of adenomyopitheliomas, tubular, uh, papillary, spindle cell. And uh, features of atypia or in adenomyopitheliomas in predominantly include increased mitotic index, nuclear pleomorphism, necrosis, all the usual suspects that you'd anticipate for, um, for, for entities of malignancy. There have been uh, relative few cases of malignant adenomyopithelioma that have been reported to date, really only been reported in women uh, with, with a wide age range, none in men, and typically been uh, larger tumors over two centimeters most commonly metastasizing to the lung, but has all, have also been documented in the brain, thyroid, and liver, uh, much more of a hematogenous spread. And so one of the first uh, series of these was by Eusebi in the early, mid-1990s, where he put together five of these ca uh, five cases of adenomyopithelioma that were associated with low-grade adenosquamous or, and sarcomatoid lesions, so they all had uh, typical adenomyopithelioma features like in the middle picture, and then some were associated with adenosquamous versus sarcomatoid carcinomas. All were alive and well with the follow-up that they, they looked into with one that had a local recurrence. Uh, the only one that's been reported uh, to date that died from, um, from, this from a version of this malignancy was a malignant adenomyopithelioma. However, this patient had uh, two recurrences and one that actually uh, had an osteosarcomatous uh, uh, differentiation when it recurred. It also metastasized to the lung, and she died shortly after three years. Otherwise, uh, the only other series that have reported um, for uh, myoepithelial, well, sorry, for myoepithelial carcinomas, um, looking at those that have been diagnosed with myoepithelioma carcinomas of the breast, the majority have also been 
uh, middle to elderly uh, women, larger tumor size, generally over two centimeters, and have also had ver uh, essentially good outcomes, either no evidence of disease or alive and well. And looking at these 15 cases of the myopathelial carcinomas, three of them of the 15 are, were arising out of an adenomyopathelioma. Uh, and looking again at the malignant adenomyopatheliomas, this is to show again the similar age range and size, as well as the presence of metastasis, most commonly in the lung, however, uh, some to brain and others that did not metastasize. There have also been reports of quote unquote benign metastasizing adenomyopatheliomas of the breast. Uh, so this was uh, two cases from UCLA and uh, this is, uh, these have been the only two so far that have been reported that have been uh, di or reported as benign metastasizing adenomyopatheliomas that were found in the breast. So uh, ultimately, uh, Treatment for adenomyopatheliomas, most have a benign course. Some have potential for local recurrence with, with rare cases of malignant transformation. Uh, standard of care today is complete excision with follow-up, e and uh, those, have the, those that have even had metastasis have generally still had good prognosis. And uh, there's no known role for axillary lymph node staging at this time, essentially due to the larger hematogenous route of spread. And um, these are some, uh, there's uh, out of Reese Filo's lab here, by, there's a paper in Nature Communications uh, by Geyer et al. These are uh, some examples of some of the atypical features in adenomyopatheliomas, and they looked at classifying adenomyopatheliomas as ER negative versus ER positive adenomyopatheliomas. And they were able to look at sequencing data from them and found for the ER positive adenomyopatheliomas, they had uh, pic 3 ca or AKT1 mutations versus the ER negative uh, adenomyopatheliomas that harbored HRAS Q61 hotspot mutations as well as the pic 3 ca mutations. And they even further looked at in, uh, for these HRAS Q61R induction in cell lines and, and the, on the left figure, the green essentially shows calponin differentiation. So looking at the hrasq 61 r mutations, essentially being able to further prove that this uh, mutation induces myoepithelial differentiation. And uh, unpublished, uh, or a manuscript that's in review uh, by Preho, who's one of the other, uh, Fraser Preho is one of the other breast pathologists. They were looking at differential hrasq 61 mutations in adenomyopatheliomas. Some have, uh, like the top row, just have the myoepithelial layers that are staining. Some have both cell populations that are staining, and some have none. And so in our patient, looking at the, uh, looking at the HRASQ61 uh, protein expression, we were more like the top row. Uh, this patient's case was more like the staining pattern of the, or protein expression of the, of the only myoepithelial cell layer. Uh, and interestingly, also matching in both components, uh, the metastatic lung lesion, and this is the primary uh, breast lesion. And very uh, interestingly, also having positive staining in the surrounding metaplastic uh, or malignant spindle cells. Uh, performing MSK impact on both of these lesions showed the exact same three uh, mutations, and uh, these are also consistent with those that we're expecting to find in the ER negative uh, adenomyopathelioma population, the hrasq Q61R mutation, as well as the PIK3CA uh, pathogenic mutation. So, Adenomyopatheliomas of the breast are an uncommon uh, benign tumor. However, they may undergo malignant transformation. For the few that have been reported, these are often preceded by having a, a stable mass that undergo a rapid period of growth, similar to this patient. And uh, it's very important to have extensive sampling of these, of these specimens to be able to potentially find these areas of interest. And uh, metastatic potential of, of the malignant adenomyopatheliomas may be related to the actual malignant component of the lesion. Uh, these are my references, and thank you. Okay. So how is this patient being treated? So yes, uh, so now after the clinical team has, um, has understood that we, they're considering this as a metastasis to the lung, they are not resecting the lung, and uh, she is uh, being followed up at this point after her mastectomy.